Hey everybody, this is Ron Taylor with uh, Rough Cut Overview. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, and we're, we're making a point to stay with Paul's prayer, or part of Paul's prayer at the end uh, in chapter 1, where he says, God will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And we've been looking at a couple of chapters, and they're, they're starting to, to form their own keys in, in the way I'm, I'm understanding them. So chapter 6, the key would be uh, judges of the universe who are judging one another. What's happening here? Paul makes an interesting statement. He says, do you not know that you can be judging angels? Or are you not capable of judging the affairs of this life? Uh, I love what he said. Uh, he said, find the, the one that is uh, least esteemed among you, that he could judge your matters. Well, what environment would that be the case? Consider that when we got a, uh, a church situation where they're breaking into factions, saying, I'm a Paul, I'm a Paul, you know, I'm a Peter the Rock. The guy that's least esteemed is the guy that's not going to have labels and titles. The guy that's avoided that. So he would be the one in that environment that would be able to most appropriately judge matters between the believers. Just thought I'd offer that. Not knowing your position and authority puts you upside down. Looking for restitution from natural authorities when in reality all things are yours. Consider that. Consider where God has put us. He's put us in Christ and Christ is sitting at his right hand. And here we are. We're going to a civil authority and asking them to deliver us. There's two admissions that are made inadvertently when we do things like that. First one is, hey, we don't have any strength on it all. We have no power. We have no authority. And the other thing uh, when we do that is we're, we're saying you're above us. So we're put upside down in that sense. We have spiritual authority. We, we, uh, we can operate with and in the context of natural authority. But we don't have to cast aside our spiritual authority at any time. All things are yours, he told them. If all things are ours, we don't have to pursue lawsuits. If you've been wronged by our brother, the apostles' advice is to take the wrong and move on. We look to the spiritual, not to the natural. If you look to the natural and you get fixated to the natural, it sometimes will make you want to pursue uh, legal action and things of that nature. Uh, our ultimate is always to be led by the Spirit and to be led by peace. And he's saying a church where you've got rampant lawsuits going on, where members are suing each other, is not good. <laughs> and uh, that's absolutely correct, isn't it? Uh, a perverted view of our authority makes the body turn on each other. When we think we have authority over people, we misunderstand our authority. We have authority in Christ. We have authority over this natural realm, this natural world. We have authority over fallen angels. We have authority over uh, the end. We have authority over the fallen mind. We have authority over Satan. We do not have authority over other believers. And uh, if we allow our view of our authority to get perverted, we start attacking each other. And that's what they were running into. In verses 9 through 14, he talks about true and false liberty. Uh, do you not know that these people shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Uh, adulterers, fornicators, and the list goes on. Let me see if I can take a look at that real quick. These will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, verse 9. I'm backing up to the beginning of verse 9. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Next verse. And that is what some of you were. Two things here. Number one, it, it, it illustrates, of course, that there's redemption from these things. But this list here of, of sins committed, um, the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, uh, men having sex with men, uh, thieves, greedy people, 
drunkards, slanderers, swindlers. They don't inherit the kingdom of God. What is, first of all, what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is this liberty and celebration that we live in in Christ, uh, where the power of God is uh, uh, obviously functioning, not, not functioning on some sort of um, theory, or theoretical uh, level, or or some sort of mystical level. We're experiencing the, the power of God. The power of God's part of our experience on a daily basis. He's saying these sins. Uh, carry with them not only their own destruction, but they also carry with them a, a hefty pack of condemnation that blocks the committer of these sins from seeing, entering, and receiving that celebration. In fact, to them, it doesn't look like celebration. To them, oftentimes, it looks like bondage. Uh, so, these, these are the things that condemnation uses to block people from the kingdom of God. And he's saying it's not God that, that's blocking people. It's, it's their perception, their lack of perception of the actual kingdom of God. Uh, when Jesus said in Luke 4, 18 through 19, the spirit of the Lord is on me for his ability to proclaim liberty to the captives. Uh, preach the gospel to the poor, said liberty to those that are the captives in the sight of the blind. That is what he called the kingdom of God. He said uh, later in the chapter toward the end, uh, when Peter found him and said, all men are looking for you, he said, we gotta go to the next city. I have to preach the kingdom of God over there as well. So there's this power of God to liberate, to free, to deliver from every bondage. Um, it's not made available uh, in the sight to these people that are trapped by these specific sins because the degree of condemnation is so high. Can they get out? Of course they can. Can they stop? Yes. Does, does God want them free? Absolutely, every time, all the time, 24 seven. How do they get free? They have to turn. Turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, and they receive forgiveness of sins. Okay, that's, that's how Paul summed up his ministry, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, Saying to God, they may receive forgiveness of sins. Okay. Striving for liberty results in bondage. Uh, this uh, this dirty dozen, if you will, of, of, of sins committed. The people that are that are entrapped in these sins, they're they're seeking liberty. But they're seeking it their own way, and that is the, the excellent way to end up in bondage. Uh, striving to be free will guarantee your bondage. Trying to make yourself free apart from the assistance of anyone else, trying to make yourself free apart from God, is to guarantee you're going to end up in bondage. It's truly what it is the work versus rest. The price has been paid, your salvation has been made complete. I don't care who you are care if you do every one of these things uh, 30 times a day even. The price has been paid for you. Your redemption has been made complete. All you have to do, like Paul said in the description of his ministry, is open your eyes and turn from the darkness to the light. Uh, but there's work, there's effort in these things. You don't recognize it, don't realize it, not when you're in the middle of it. But prepaid ticket to Hawaii, if you will, it doesn't take work to earn it. Seeing how far you can go in darkness and confusion and the sins of, of, that are listed in this passage and other sins, that does take effort. Verses 15 through 20, your choice, my choice, our choice, the choice in the church to flow in what we call holiness, or honoring God with our bodies, avoiding fornication, or living in a level of love toward the people around us that, that would uh, uh, not permit us to steal or, or you know, cheat them or do wrong to them. Uh, all that, that's not for God's benefit. It's for our benefit, okay? We don't prop up God's holiness by our conduct. Our conduct allows the world to see how Jesus is, okay? When our conduct matches the character of God, 
it allows the world to see Jesus in a different way. And how does that accomplish? How do we do that? Well, we don't do that by our striving or our efforts. We do that by allowing him to flow through us and, and allowing him to use us as a reflection. Okay, but our efforts to be holy, are, they're outmoded. Our uh, actual holiness produced by the Holy Spirit in and through our lives, that's a gift to us. That's not helping God accomplish anything, okay? Uh, in a sense, we are co-laborers with him. Uh, his work is accomplished many times through uh, tents of flesh, human vessels. Uh, but he is not in a position where he is relying on us in the sense that he's relying on our witness, our testimony, our abilities to make him look good. He is love. He is. We don't do anything to add to that. Uh, we only let him who is operate through us, and that is successful Christian living. All right. See you next time.